OK, so are we live? That's us live, John, yeah? Yes, that's us live. OK, hi, everybody. Sorry about the delay. Um, welcome to our webinar today on vulnerability, exploitation and the cost of living crisis. Um, I can see some people in the chat saying that they are waiting to get into the meeting. We should be live now. All OK with you guys? Excellent, you can hear me. Wonderful. So today we are going to share some insights from three different organisations about the cost of living crisis um, and how it has exacerbated uh, specific vulnerabilities and led to further exploitation um, and give some examples and, and practice insights on this. Um, so if you're having any tech difficulties, we've got Laura on hand. So if you just want to send Laura a little message in the chat, she'll be able to help you out. Um, we will be sharing all of our resources after the event and you should be getting links throughout. When we uh, we have a, a Q&A function, so if you've got any questions, please ask them through the Q&A function. You should be able to access that already. Um, and just in terms of safeguarding for yourselves, we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy stuff this morning. Um, I'm sure you understood that when you signed up to the event. Um, but we're going to be talking about violence against women. We're going to be talking about all forms of gender based violence and financial exploitation. So just a moment to um, look after yourselves, uh, be respectful when you're asking questions and engaging in the chat. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce Katie Brown. Um, she's here with us today to, to give us our introduction. Um, she's an equally safe policy manager at COSLA. Um, so, Katie, if you want to take control and take it away, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, um, as introduced, my name's Katie. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have been asked to present on the Equally Safe strategy to give a bit of context to the rest of um, uh, the, the rest of the information and the discussion and the thinking that's going to go on today. Um, so. This webinar is going to be looking at how the cost of living crisis has impacted the vulnerability of women and girls and how this has led to an increased risk for women of exploitation. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just going to, over the next 10 minutes or so, just take you through in quite quite a, a speedy overview of the national context of the work that can help and frame some of the uh, awareness and development um, and uh, how the awareness and development around um, women's vulnerabilities and in particular I'm here to talk about Equally Safe which is um, the strategy that um, frames uh, the Scottish Government and COSLA's joint approach to uh, preventing and challenging violence against women and girls and this is just a really important thing to know about and to understand in whatever role that you're in um, working right across our sector. So equally safe, Scotland's strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. Um, sorry, I'm toggling between two screens here, so bear with me. COSLA is committed to co-ownership of this strategy with the Scottish Government. Now, um, this means that both the Scottish Government and local government in Scotland are committed to working together with various national and local partners and stakeholders from across the public and the third sectors to drive forward progress against the aims of Equally Safe. Um, it's been around for quite a wee while, so it was originally um, developed um, and it's been co-owned um, by both spheres of government since 2014. Now, when we're talking about violence against women and girls, um, we're meaning the violent and abusive behaviour carried out predominantly by men directed at women and girls precisely because of their gender. The strategy is informed by the United Nations analysis of violence against women and girls that states that violence against women and girls limits women's and girls' freedom and potential and is a fundamental violation of human rights. So moving on, um, the strategy's definition of violence against women and girls includes the actual and the threat of all of these different forms of violence and abuse. So we're talking about physical, sexual, psychological, emotional and financial abuse occurring within the family, within the general community 
and in institutions in both physical and in digital spaces and places. We're talking about domestic abuse and coercive controlling behaviours. We're talking about stalking, rape, incest, sexual harassment, bullying and intimidation. We're talking about commercial sexual exploitation and that includes prostitution. Within that, we're talking also about lap dancing, stripping, pornography, human trafficking, including for the purposes of domestic servitude, sexual exploitation and child criminal exploitation. And that may include gangs and organised criminal networks. We're talking also, and this is really important in the context of our national strategy, about child abuse, which occurs within family settings, including domestic abuse and sexual abuse by male family members, including siblings. Child sexual abuse and exploitation, including the production and sharing of indecent images of children, honour-based abuse, including forced marriages, female genital mutilation, dairy abuse and honour-based coercive control and killings. Now, we also know that victim survivors may experience more than one form of abuse and that all of these have the same roots or causal factors. So the behaviours tackled by this national strategy are predominantly, as I've said before, carried out by men and experienced by women. And these behaviours stem from deep rooted gender inequality which across spheres of government and across our sectors, we agree through the Equally Safe strategy is absolutely unacceptable in a modern day Scotland. So violence against women and girls is understood to be both a cause and a consequence of women's inequality. It is an abuse of power and it stems from systematic, deep rooted women's inequality. Moving on. So, as I said, um, Equally Safe is not new. It was initially published actually way back in 2014 and it uh, was updated in 2016. And the update in 2016 was informed by um, real, really powerful collaboration between and across the children and young people's sectors um, and uh, the women's and specialist violence against women and girls sectors and all the other key organisations uh, in the public sector that work together to tackle and challenge violence against women and girls. Um, and um, we uh, there were uh, uh, there was originally a, a, a really, really weighty delivery plan and then there was an interim delivery plan, which was um, refreshed in 2013 and um, we had a refreshed strategy just published there at the end of last year and uh, hopefully uh, in the coming month we will be publishing a refreshed delivery plan. Now it's really important for everybody on this call and I'm absolutely impressed at the, the breadth of uh, interest in relation to this topic uh, and, in, and, and in relation to all of the different um, services and sectors from which you have all come to spend your precious time today because it's really important to know that within the context of the new delivery plan that is uh, about um, to begin and will continue to guide our work in this area over the next two years there is an absolute place for every single person to be looking at their role and to be uh, using their expertise their commitment um, and their understanding uh, to um, enable us to really work together collectively to do something about this scourge. So um, the impacts of violence against women and girls are something that we all need to understand um, and take very seriously. They're very wide ranging. They can have a long term impact on the lives of those affected as well as on their families and as well as on communities. Gender inequality and violence against women and girls hurts us all. Women, children and young people who've experienced violence, abuse and exploitation in Scotland are at increased risk of experiencing inequality of outcomes throughout their lives, including physical and mental health problems, homelessness, drug and alcohol support needs, reduced education and employment opportunities, injuries and even death.
sorry, my slide's stuck. Oh, here we go. Um, so the drivers for the work as we're moving on at the moment um, have been identified um, um, as uh, these bullet points that you're seeing in front of you now. It was really important that the strategy was refreshed last year, um, but it's always been recognised that the strategy is committed to driving significant long term societal and structural change. So while we can be confident that over the last years we've made some progress towards our goals, there is still much work to be done. In addition to the global slow speed of change towards women full equality, the impact of the pandemic current world instabilities and tensions and the resultant cost of living crisis have all had a significant impact on that progress and there has been some backward motion evidenced. So it's absolutely critical that our work is centred in the realities of our times. Through a recent broad engagement programme led by the Scottish Government, the seven key drivers for the refresh strategy became clear as they are outlined on this slide. In summary, despite many advances, there remains persistent inequalities between men and women in Scotland across areas of social, political, economic and cultural life. So commitments will be taken forward by an equally safe delivery programme of measurable actions against the identified priorities of the refresh strategy. And these are more clearly outlined on our next slide as Um, the prevention of violence against women and girls before it occurs, so primary prevention, supporting early intervention, building a broad and shared understanding across our society and our communities of what violence against women and girls is, how it affects those who experience it, its impact um, and its causes, so that we can reduce the harm together. We're also focusing on further building and embedding that whole system commitment and contribution to preventing and tackling violence against women and girls. Um, so that's what makes it everybody's business. We want to ensure that perpetrators are visible and are held accountable. We want to embed prevention, protection and provision into the daily mindset of mainstream services and responses while absolutely ensuring that our specialist support services are accessible and available to those who need them. And we want to really focus on those who are at most at risk. We need to focus on intersectional understanding, intersectional approaches responding to the compounding, compounding sorry, inequalities impacting women's and girls' lives. So um, the cost of living crisis, and I suppose you're thinking that's 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 the if, if we're talking about violence against women and girls being both the cause and consequence of women's inequality, what we have to really understand is how fundamental the cost of living crisis um, is within the context of this conversation and how fundamental our uh, understanding of women's vulnerabilities within this environment is. So this is the fact. Gender stereotypes and norms continue to limit women's access to opportunities in the labour market and economic resources, which affects levels of economic independence. So here's a wee quick overview. These deeply embedded and rooted systematic gender inequalities continue to ensure that women are more likely than men to live in poverty. The report Poverty in Scotland in 2023 found that just over 10% of workers in Scotland are locked in persistent low pay and 72% of those are women. The vast majority, and that's 80% of those trapped in low pay work, in hospitality, health and social work, health and social care, retail administrative support and or manufacturing. Um, uh, are experiencing in-work poverty, and this is holding back further progress in terms of gender equality. So women, disabled people and minority ethnic people overall, and in particular, are at the eye of this storm 
of persistent low pay, unreliable and insufficient hours and a struggle to make ends meet. Rises in the cost of living have made circumstances for women and particularly disabled minority ethnic and single parent women even more precarious. So let's add violence against women and girls into this mix. Women experiencing abuse in the home will find it more difficult to leave their abuser if they're living in poverty. Poverty can be a factor in preventing women from accessing support for safety and well-being needs. <clears throat> Controlling women through abuse may and indeed is likely to include economic abuse. Limiting women's access to making money or and limiting access to basic resources, limiting or negating savings, limiting access to welfare support, diverting payments to abusers, access to pensions controlled, all of this and very much more can be used as part of the wider controls of abuse and coercive control. Women are overwhelmingly most likely to be single parents who are overwhelmingly likely to be living with economic hardships. Economic abuse through limiting or denying access to child support often continues even after a relationship is over. In abusive relationships or in commercial, commercially exploitative circumstances, women will often be forced into exploitative money borrowing or and be expected to clear or carry abusers' debts, some to prison. Debts payable created by abusive exploiters maintain control and limit access to personal freedoms, autonomy and safety. Women in these circumstances are not only vulnerable to financial exploitation as part of the abuse, but as the impacts of this plus the cost of living crisis is biting deeper into lives where margins are already tiny, they become even more vulnerable to those who seek to further profit from them. So it is up to us and all of us, whatever we do, whatever services or sectors we operate in, to consider the vulnerabilities of women and girls and their children within this context. So where do you see the opportunities for those who wish to benefit from the exploitation of women, young people and children impacted by any of the forms of violence against women, women and girls outlined as the cost of living crisis bites further? How can you work to prevent these opportunities how can you intervene early? How can you offer support and safety? How can you signpost to specialist services? How can you enable recovery? And how will you hold perpetrators to account? This isn't an us and them situation because of course we know that over a lifetime, there are uh, huge numbers of women who experience these forms of violence and abuse. We know that we're not talking about um, us in our roles as service providers being any different from us in our roles of people who may have experienced abuse, whether as a child into adulthood as a woman. We're not talking about differences between those of us and them who are recovering and who are moving forward in their lives. I just want us to consider and understand that we are powerful in our professional roles. As long as we open our minds and we do the work to understand that all of these pressures compound both the experience of abuse and the opportunities to move forward into positive lives where everybody can be safe. So thank you for being here this morning and listening to this brief strategic overview, which I hope has given you some context from a national uh, level into the equally safe strategy and how that links with the subject that you're here to talk about today. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Katie. Um, I we're just going to try and fix the slides. We do understand that the slides weren't moving for everyone. I know they were moving for me, but I do understand they weren't moving for everyone else. So let me just try and see if we can fix that just now. John, will people be able to get a copy of the slides if they haven't seen them? They will. We will make sure the slides are sent out after the, the, the meeting has been held and hopefully that will mean that everyone that missed out on the on going through the slides as they were happening there, that will hopefully, um, hopefully there. So that should be hopefully, he says. Uh, can everyone see the slides now? Can I just say, John, before we move on, if anybody does want more detail, given the, the slides weren't moving, my email address was on the front of that slide deck and I really welcome yeah. anybody getting in touch with me to find out more about uh, what's going on within the context of Equally Safe. And if I can link you up with other work that's happening that is pertinent to you, please do get in touch. Perfect. Um, we do have the Q&A function. What we will do is we will look to try and take those questions in. So if you do have any questions at all, please use the Q&A function at the top. Um, I know some people have already put some stuff in there and I've tried to answer them in terms of the technical questions. But I think everyone can... Could everyone see that slide move back to equally safe there? I think, hopefully, because everyone was able to see it. Robin, I will hand back over to you now um, for, for the next section. OK, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, not used to running a Teams webinar. <laughs> um, John, it's saying requesting control is disabled by the share company's administrator. Could you allow me to take control and I'll take it away? This is probably one of the biggest audiences I've had for an online event. And of course, we're having every technical difficulty under the sun. <laughs> so we might have to cut our break a wee bit quick, a wee bit shorter um, so that we can get back on track. There we go. OK, I'm able to take control, I think. Sure. Oh, no. No, give me a second. It's Thanks, John. Clear not. We've got a wee question there in the chat. If you want to pop it into the um, Q&A function for us and we'll be able to address the questions as we go, um, just so that we've got them all in one place because sometimes it gets lost in the chat. I think that was um, an unknown user. Thanks, Linda. I feel like I'm just like ad-libbing. I've got a special guest today. This is Bean, <laughs> my cat. <laughs> um, he'll probably be bothering me this entire time, so apologies for that. OK, well, we I'll, seem I'll, to be... Yeah, I'll give you back control now. That Excellent. Should work. Wonderful. OK, a few bumps in the road, but here we are. Let me find my slides. And then I'll go for OK, you should be able to see a financially included side. Um, can you see just the slides? You can't see my notes or anything. <laughs> I'm getting thumbs up. OK, excellent. I'm going to go for it. So hi, I'm Robin. <laughs> uh, my name is Robin Moffatwall. I'm from Financially Included. Um, we are a partnership project between GMAP, a money advice service, and the Glasgow Violence Against Women Partnership. And our focus um, as a project is tackling economic abuse, the economic impact of gender based violence, um, specifically looking at direct support for survivors of economic abuse. It was great to have Katie with us today. We are funded by um, delivering Equally Safe, so we fit nicely into the Equally Safe strategy um, in preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. And this is a very specific form of violence against women and girls. Katie already touched on um, the, the impact that money has on kind of continuing and perpetuating abuse, especially in domestic abuse settings. But we'll talk more broadly about that. You might have met our team. 
Um, we're a very small team and we've been going since the start of 2022. So we're only two years old um, and we've, we're small but mighty. So um, we've got our, our, our fearless leader, um, Amber Cully, who is our project manager. Um, she does all of our overseeing and keeps steering us in the right direction. I am the training and engagement officer. My job is primarily delivering training for money advisors and frontline women sector workers, as well as some other workers around how to respond to economic abuse. Um, so if that is of interest in your role, um, our email address will be at the end of this slide and I'll share it in the links um, so that if you are interested in getting some training for us, very bespoke training, much more in depth than today, please do get in touch. And then Yitka and Rosemary are our two welfare rights advisors or advice and capability officers. Um, and what they do is really unique work. Uh, they work direct one to one with women who have experienced gender based violence and they support them um, in a really holistic manner with recovering from the economic impact of, of gender based violence. Um, so if you think about uh, domestic abuse, for example, most victims of domestic abuse become homeless at some point. Think about the economic impact on you as a person uh, that be becoming homeless means. Maybe you've had to give up your mortgage. Maybe you've had to give up your private rental. How does that impact your work? Are you able to work? Uh, maybe you've had to take long term sick leave. What does that do for your economic situation? Do you know what I mean? Um, and not just domestic abuse, it can be things like a single incident assault, um, maybe a rape or, or something of that nature. Um, and we have a lot of women who become unwell because of the mental health impacts of those assaults. Um, and that has an economic impact on them as well. If you can't go to work, then, you know, how are you going to fund your life? How are you going to feed your children? How are you going to pay for your the, the roof over your head? So these are all the economic impacts of gender based violence. And specifically, we look at economic abuse as a form of gender based violence itself. Um, and this is a definition from Adams et al, um, where uh, control over a partner's access to e economic resources, diminishing their capacities to support themselves and create dependencies on the perpetrator. So what that means is it's really about isolating, much like coercive control, it's really about isolating the victim and making them much more dependent on the perpetrator because of the, those financial links. And it doesn't just have to be money. It can be all forms of things. So financial abuse would be the control and coercion of your, your cash money, your financial things, your financial products. Whereas economic abuse is wider. If it, all those things about work, your health, all these things that allow you to to engage in the economy and, and work and generate income. Um, that's that kind of wider umbrella of economic abuse. We had an illustrator come along to one of our events, Nick Dixon, sorry, Dr. Nick Dixon, um, and she created these these graphics for us. So you're seeing a Jenga tower in our training. We play economic abuse Jenga. Um, and it really paints the picture you see there. A job is an economic resource. Your confidence is an economic resource. Um, child care savings, support network. How many of us depend on our support network to maintain our economic standards? I know I do. I'd be nothing without my support network. Transport, housing, phone, cash, uh, access to advice, you name it. There's so many different things. Think about where you're sitting right now. What economic resources are you using to engage with us today? I'm using my laptop and a keyboard and a screen and lights and clothes. All of these things are economic resources that I depend on to live my life and do my job. But if someone was controlling my access to those resources, maybe I wouldn't be able to do my job so well. Maybe my boss would be very unhappy with me. And maybe that would have a financial impact on me and make me more dependent on a perpetrator of abuse. So that's just some examples of how these dynamics work. Economic abuse can have so many impacts on the victims. So it depends on what, what happens, you know, so if it's coercing you to take out financial products that you don't want to or doing it fraudulently. So maybe taking out debt in your name that impacts your credit score for a very long time. It also means that you are going to be chased up by um, 
by creditors and their debt collectors, which is really, really stressful. And what we hear from the women that we support is that they feel isolated as a result of this. They feel humiliated and degraded. Um, and I find the, the puppet illustration there um, controlled by anxiety and fear that really resonates with a lot of the women that we support. Um, and it's sometimes it's not even the fear or the anxiety about the perpetrator himself. Um, it's much more af even after separation, once you're a wee bit more free, so to speak, um, the the impact of financial abuse and economic abuse can continue beyond. Um, and that's what we call post separation abuse. Um, and that fear and anxiety continu continues to linger and control you for um, a long period of time. So I'm going to share with you some examples um, and testimonies from women that we support. The quotes are in their own words, but it's not their voices. Um, so th this can be a wee bit hard hitting, so please just take some deep breaths and um, look after yourselves. Hopefully we will have no tech issues with this. Let's see. So I want to thank Chance to Change for sharing their experiences with us. Um, it was it was really um, powerful, I think, speaking to this group. Um, we've, you know what, I'll, I'll skip past talking about poverty as a gendered issue, as I think um, Katie did a perfect job of that. I want to share with you some um, insights into how the cost of living is impacting women as a general group rather than just survivors of economic abuse. Um, and we we found um, there was a, a research done into the energy crisis last year. Um, and they found that 70% of women haven't been putting their heating on when they felt they needed to. Um, and for women earning under 20,000 pounds a year, that was 80%. Um, and we, when we went out for home visits, because we, we deliver home visits for our clients, when we went into their homes this winter, we had to go in in jackets and gloves because they could not afford to put on their heating. Some women had gone as far as moving their children's beds into one room and living in one room and heating one room. Um, and we also had a woman who was um, 
filling up a very big thermos with boiled water in the morning and that's all she would use that day she wouldn't um she wouldn't boil the kettle again she would she could only afford to boil it once per day um and i think that is a really really bleak um experience for for women across the country and there's a lot of people that are experiencing this but uh, with the backdrop that katie gave for us that context of how women experience things differently because of unequal um treatment of women i think it's 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 dire um, that same research found that 20% of women were skipping meals entirely uh, for disabled women. That was 34%. Um, and there's a quote here that says, um, direct debit payments increased so much that I could not afford my monthly payments. The energy company would not accept partial coverage. So I switched quarterly and slashed my energy use. Now I only heat one room. I'm constantly thinking about my energy consumption. Um, and I think it's it's something that comes off of our minds a little bit when it's lovely and warm like it has been lately, albeit wet. Um, but there's been less need to put the heating on. But earlier in the year, it was um, it was bleak going out to our clients' houses and it was horrible to see that the way that their children were having to live, um, going out in all these layers of clothing. Um, and for people that are trying to recover and rebuild their lives after horrible traumas and abuse, it's um, it's a really horrible way to 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 be living um, purely because they don't have the money. This is a really horrible quote that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, this came from one of our clients' perpetrators. Um, they'd separated and they were both really quite um, comfortable financially. They're both working high earners and he was uh, after they split, he started engaging in post separation abuse by um, bringing up inconsequential really legal battles um, and he declared himself as uh, self-employed and not earning anything so he qualified for legal aid whereas his ex soon to be ex-wife uh, who was earning what 35 grand or so um, she didn't qualify for legal aid so she was having to pay to fight these legal battles that he was bringing up against her through their separation separation of assets that kind of thing um, and this was a text he sent her saying I will ruin you without ever touching you and while uh, kind of preventing violence is the thing that we are all so so here to do, um, that financial ruin will impact her life for years and years. We have um, an 80 year old woman who has been facing the financial consequences for 40 years for something that happened to her when she was much, much younger. Um, so it's really important that we are aware of the financial impacts of, ec of economic abuse and gender based violence. Um, and part of what I say when I go out to train money advisors is that it is your business. It is it's not a personal matter. It is a financial matter that they need genuine, compassionate advice about. Katie again um, gave a really good insight into the, the context of how the cost of living crisis is impacting women. 23% of women um, told the Scottish Women's Budget Group that they are taking on more debt and 40% of single mums saying that they are taking on more debt as well. So even for that group, it's much higher. And as women take on more debt out of need or desperation, if they struggle to maintain those regular payments or they become overwhelmed by the interest rates, they may find themselves being ineligible for many more legitimate types of credit. So we heard in that um, that someone's credit rating was impacted so much that they weren't able to get um, to pay their energy by direct debit and they had to go on a prepayment meter. We spoke to the Women's um, Support Project about concerns about these things which they shared and um, we're going to talk more about that later with Laura and obviously loan sharks are on the rise again taking advantage of this economic crisis um, and we, we are just really worried about how all of these vulnerabilities are exacerbated by the cost of living crisis. And again, it's not just about the abuse. It's not just about the money. It has a, an impact on our mental health as well. 65% of women say that the cost of living crisis has impacted their mental health. Um, and I think something we talk about financially included a lot is in the UK, we have this horrible hush culture about talking about our personal finances as if it's a shameful and uniquely private thing. 
um, and money advisors, if we have any today, um, they will tell you that debt is one of the hardest areas to work in to give advice on. Um, and I think a lot of, of that is about the stigma and shame that we associate with debt as a society. You know, unless it's a mortgage or a good debt, we are ashamed of our debt. Um, in the report from the Scottish Women's Budget Group, one woman said the shame of having to apply for help has putting me off doing this. So I just go without because of that stigma. And if you think about um, that stigma of debt, uh, that stigma of being poor and not having enough money and being a mother and that mum guilt that is so often experienced uh, from poor families. What about the additional stigma and shame and, and taboo around gender based violence? If you've also been victim of these types of crimes, that's just shame on shame on shame silencing you. So it's really important that professionals across all sectors are aware of these issues and asking about these issues and confident in addressing them because um, these people, we can't expect them to go, excuse me, I'm a, I'm a victim of economic abuse and I need help. They need us to be actively engaging with them on that and show that we are interested and capable of helping them. Um, and how we can do that is by working in partnership together. Um, what what I say to money advisors all the live long day is speak to one another, speak to your local women's organisations. Um, we've got people from all over Scotland today, which is amazing. Um, we need to work in partnership and learn from one another. And I think events like this are really, really useful in getting that ball rolling. So as I say, please do get in touch if you think you'd be interested in learning more about how to respond to economic abuse. Um, and I know there's, there's other training available for, for other um, issues. So there's our email address. We will share all this um, and you will get my slides. I'm very sorry if that video didn't work for everybody. Um, I can share it as part of the slides. Um, sorry about that. Um, we're really getting no luck. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break. We um, are running a wee bit behind. So if we can all come back at 10.55, um, and if you have a chance, if you could maybe take a wee second in the chat to let us know one key takeaway from our first part of the session this morning. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to thank you for being here today. So I'll see you at 10.55. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone, and hope everyone had a nice five minute break there, a nice chance to stretch your legs, get a wee a wee glass of water or a coffee or whatever have as your fancy. So I'm going to kick off the second part of the, the session to look at illegal money lenders. So my name is John Pollock. I'm the partnership and support officer with the Scottish Illegal Money Lending Unit. Um, I've been with the team now over 16 years. I've had a variety of roles across the team, including having been an investigator of illegal money lenders for about a period of about three and a half, four years. The Scottish Legal Money Lending Unit has actually been around since 2004. We will celebrate our 20th anniversary in August this year. Um, those that are here today and those that had signed up for the event will probably in the next week or two see a, a nice invite coming along to an event that we're hosting to try and get everyone's views on, on where we are and kind of look a uh, kind of retrospective look back and then a look to the future. We are currently part of Training Centre Scotland at COSLA and we are funded by a uh, Treasury and it's from a levy in the financial institutions that we receive our funding. We have the remit to investigate illegal money lending or more commonly called loan sharking in Scotland. We are a civil law enforcement agency. Um, when I say civil, I don't mean this comes under civil law, it actually comes the, the legal aspect of this comes under criminal law, but we are a civilian law enforcement agency. Our two main aims are about intervention and prevention or divert and deter, however ways you want to put at it, but we want to stop it by any means necessary. We provide a lot of guidance, tailor the training and campaigning. Those are a lot of the work that we do, especially that I lead on as well. And we provide support to borrowers and affected others, but also to support organisations because we do know that not only is it a massive step forward for people who are borrowing from an illegal money lender, but um, it's also the impact on those around them as well. It is significant and it's severe, and I hope to try and be able to talk you through some of that today. So what are illegal money lenders? Well, they're, they're people that target people. They will look to make to make hay while the sun shines in somebody's financial misery. They will take advantage of people in whatever circumstances they find themselves in, whether that be medical, whether that be physical, whether whatever that be. And they will make they will start out just all nice and they'll start out all friendly, but the reality is they very quickly turn away. Ultimately, right now, the biggest problem we've got is there's a lack of affordable credit out there for people. It's just one of those things just now we're going through. We've lost one of our big, biggest CDFIs in Scotland, Scott Cash. We have had nothing really to replace it in the last wee while. Credit unions fill part of that void, but they don't fill all of that void as well. So it's a bigger, bit of a difficult circumstance with them taking on some of the people that are that are looking to access credit. And many of the people that borrow from illegal money lenders don't have the ability, the, the financial history, whether that be credit score or whether that be previous debts. And you heard what both Katie and Robin were talking about in the earlier session. Really, one of the things that leads people to going down this route is because it's easy, it's quick, and it seems nice and cheap. But the reality is the loan sharks only care about one thing and that's making money out of other people's suffering. So where are they operating? Well, they're operating right across every part of Scotland. There is so much so much happening right across mainland Scotland. We don't have a lot coming from the islands, but we certainly have very, very in-depth knowledge of what's happening in terms of what we know about and there's the old saying there's the known knowns and the, un the known unknowns. We don't know what the scale of the problem is because it's so well hidden, but we have a better idea, but we have a better idea now than probably what we've ever had in the most recent past. And I'll come on to talk about that a bit later, but certainly from our perspective, illegal money lending can happen absolutely everywhere. We've seen it happen in doctor surgeries. We've seen it happening in workplaces. We've seen it happening from taxi drivers, on the street, at food banks. We've seen it happening absolutely everywhere. But what about the impact on the borrowers? And borrowing from an illegal money lender, it is, for so many people, they'll say the same thing. It was easy, it was quick. Oh yeah, I was short of cash and um, I had to go and borrow. To use a quote from uh, some um, research we had done back in 2017, where a female borrower stated that 
she had borrowed money because her partner had used all their money to buy drugs. She was left with nothing, and the only way to feed her and the kids was to go and borrow from a loan shark. That led her down into a financial despair that there was very, very little chance of getting away from. It looked easy for her. It looked the best option, but the reality is it wasn't, and it was something that really impacted her going forward. People that borrow from illegal money lenders become trapped in a never-ending cycle of borrowing. The loan shark will deliberately make you default. They'll deliberately charge you more and more and more interest. They'll charge you whatever they feel like. It has a detrimental impact on people's mental health. We have unfortunately had people commit suicide to get away from illegal money lenders. We've had a number of people attempt to take their own life and as an attempt to get away from the pressure being exerted upon them by the social worker, eh, by the social worker, by this, the illegal money lender. We do see physical violence. It's not as common as what I think TV would have you think. But the reality is it does happen on occasions. Exploitation is the most regular thing that we see come across, whether that be financial or sexual. People are forced into doing things against their will to help pay off the debts that they've got. An example of this, very recently, we received a phone call from an individual who owed someone £100,000 and a legal money lender he was not able to pay back and as a result of this the illegal money lender forced him to commit, commit a criminal act for which he was caught his life is in complete tatters now his wife is losing her business he has been sacked from his job because he's been convicted of this criminal offence all because he borrowed from a loan shark it's absolutely key that we intervene and by what I mean by intervening is that we will take direct action against illegal money lenders. If we identify a case and we put everything together, we would hope that that individual will end up in court. It is punishable for up to two years in prison illegal money lending. It is not a slap in the wrist crime. It also falls under the Proceeds of Crime Act as well. So it's absolutely key that we intervene where we possibly can. Anything that comes across our way is treated in the strictest of confidences. We know that it is a massive step forward for people to come and speak about being the victim of a crime. We, Our main and only real goal in all this is to make sure the client is safe and can be able to transition away from borrowing from the legal money lender. However we do that, however we achieve it, is absolutely key for us. So what sort of signs are we looking for? Well, we're looking for people that have got little or no paperwork for a loan. They don't know how much they owe. They're paying cash. Again, we, we've moved away to be a bit more of a, a cashless society. So again, if people are paying loans back in cash, I would say that's unusual now. If you're working with someone and you're and you're helping them, um, and you're you're helping them with their bank account, if you see unusual transactions going from the bank account on a regular basis, then what I would say is that 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 would be unusual. Come and talk to us; we can help you as much as we can help the client with regards to this. The borrower doesn't want to see who they borrowed from. There's a bit of embarrassment there. All those things are are really very much, very very difficult. They claim to borrow from a friend or a family. You wouldn't believe the amount of people that see their illegal money lender as their friend. How they're looking after them rather than they're financially exploiting them. I'll give a very quick example. The very first case I worked on back in 2008 when I joined the team was in the north of Glasgow. And when speaking to the victims of this crime, every one of them said, oh no, he's a good guy. He looks after me. And how and I said, well, how does he? He says, well, he he collects my money from the the post office, and he gives me my money. No, what he was actually doing was operating what he called a direct debit service, where he was taking the money out of the account and giving it across to the person 
at whatever he felt they were due that week. They just thought he was a great guy, and they're just not. And meeting with a lender on an unusual location, I would go as far to say now that meeting with a, someone in an unusual location includes your doorstep. Doorstep lending in this country has has dramatically fallen off the cliff the cliff in the last few years. Provident no longer exists. Moss's Club no longer exists. There are some smaller organisations out there. But the reality is if someone is offering a loan door to door, I would be challenging that to see whether or not, and I would be making sure that is someone who is a legitimate lender. Ultimately, it's about asking the question of the client. And I've put some tips up here, and, and I know we'll share the slides at the end of the session, and I hope you're able to use these. But ultimately, come and speak to us as well. Come and speak to us. We are here to help support providers as much as we're here to help the clients. If you have any question, please come and speak to us. If you've got a client sitting there and you're just not sure, come and talk to us. But ultimately, we, we have to realise that we can remove every loan chart we possibly can, but is it really going to solve the problem? So we have to move to prevention focus over the last six, seven years. And during COVID, it gave us a chance to really reset and allow us to really focus upon why prevention is key. And we do this in several ways, and it's working with partners to divert them, divert potential borrowers. We can't let people get to the stage where they have to use illegal money lenders. We just can't. We provide training. We provide training from two hour in depth sessions to one hour quick hit sessions. We provide webinars like this we're doing today. We do as much as we possibly can to educate everyone about what illegal money lending is. We also have prevention projects that run across Scotland. I think at the moment we've currently got eight and we're looking to, to take on some more. These are really and community based projects that will stop people falling prey to illegal money lending. And ultimately, we have to campaign to raise awareness. We ran our, our spring campaign back in May. And I'm really lucky to be surrounded by a very good team of prevention colleagues who really support what we're trying to do in our campaign and messaging. So ultimately, we have to raise the discourse in this country about illegal money lending. We have to remove it from being hidden. We have to make it a safe reporting environment for people and a safe environment where people can talk about money. We have so many resources available via our website. They are in different languages, so please um, download them. You can have, we can send out um, hard copies if people want them as well. And if there's any ideas for more resources, please get in touch with us. I said earlier on about our campaigns. We run a lot of them through our social media, but we were also running campaigns on STV and our 20th anniversary campaign will be running between the middle of August and the end of October. We also have our big winter campaign that takes place from the middle of November right through to the middle of January. Because we know at that time of the year, it's most likely where people are considering borrowing from illegal money lenders. I said earlier on about training, so I've provided more details there for people to, to take away. Please get in touch with us if, you, if there's anything at all that you want to, to want from that. And again, about the prevention projects. We do have a Stop Loan Sharks Charter. We're currently having us under review just now to see what more we can do. We're hoping to relaunch it um, alongside our 20th anniversary event. So please get in touch with us, please. If you're interested in setting up a charter, which really just states that we're all going to work together to remove illegal money lenders from our communities and not allow them to thrive. We have plenty of referral procedures for anybody that's got someone who is a victim of this crime and what support we can do together. And I've got the details at the end. Here's a current picture of what we know across Scotland just now. These are our identified illegal money lenders since 2004. This is up to date as of about two weeks ago. Again, you'll be able to see this, so you'll be able to look at your areas. We know that we have zero from the Western Isles, Shetland and Orkney. The reason for that, we believe, is because the communities are, are, are pretty small and everyone knows everyone else. And we have this issue also in some of our more rural communities in the Highland and Argyll and Butte, 
where everyone knows everyone else. It's very hard for someone to come forward and report, and it's a very scary prospect for them. So what does the data tell us? Well, we identified 18 new loan charts last year. That was a record year for us. We, not all of those, unfortunately, have been, have been fully investigated yet. Many of those investigations are still ongoing. We're at our busiest um, point we've ever had in terms of ongoing investigations. It used to be when I first started with the team, we would have a bit of downtime after we'd investigated a case. No, it's not the case anymore. I was in our intelligence meeting yesterday where we know already what next cases we're moving on to once we've wrapped up the three that are ongoing just now. The amount borrowed per person or the amount owed per person is around about £12,500 per person. The highest we have seen this year, somebody owes, is £125,000. That is a ridiculous amount of money. We got reports from 12 different local authority areas. We already talked about the cost of living crisis that we're still in. That is the main issue for people borrowing from illegal money lenders. It should be not a surprise to anybody here, given what both Katie and Robin spoke about earlier. Threats and intimidation are rising. And very recent research, and I'm meaning very recent as it was published just last week, from Fair for All Finance, estimated that 3.3 million people across Great Britain have used illegal money lenders in the past three years, currently in the past three years. If we look at that figure from Scotland, the Scottish perspective, that works out to be roughly about 8.5% of the GB population, not the UK population, but the GB population, that works out to an estimated 277,000 people in Scotland using illegal money lenders. Some very rudimentary maths would suggest that if every illegal money lender has between 20 to 30 people on their books at any one time, that would indicate there's over 8,000 illegal money lenders currently operating in Scotland. It's a large, large amount. But how does this all look, look into sexual exploitation? And we've identified a number of cases over the years where this has come to the fore. Female in her 20s was forced into prostitution by an organised criminal gang due to borrowing for her gambling habit. A male lender in Glasgow who basically forced female borrowers to help reduce their payment by performing sexual acts. And a male lender in Aberdeen lent specifically to Thai females with the intention or forcing them into a sexual relationship. It's all about control for illegal money lenders. It's about extracting every single penny they can and controlling the people that have borrowed from them lives. They are not Robin Hood type characters. They are not nice people. These are criminals and they deserve to be punished. I'll just leave you with two quotes from research that was published by Fair For All last year. Stuff was going to happen to me, but not just me. I get threats came came hurting from my family. Do you know what I mean? I was like, oh, your mum's going to get this, your brother's going to get that. That was from a borrower in Glasgow. I knew the man, and I knew violence that has been dished out by the man. He just needed to tell me that I had to grow cannabis because I owed him money, and I needed to pay my debt, and it was violence. It was never directly said to me. I had seen him give somebody a leather in with a metal pole. That's the people we're dealing with. Laura's kindly put some links in the chat already, um, thinking in, again, when you get the presentation out there, that is, again, links to all of our, our social media stuff and all the rest of it. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to come along and talk today, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I'll now hand over to Laura to take you through the last part of our session. Thanks very much, John. It was such a useful presentation and I'm finally glad to emerge from the chat. So good morning, everyone. My name is Laura. I'm a development and engagement worker with the Women's Support Project. The focus of my input today is a specific form of gender-based violence, which is commercial sexual exploitation, and how the cost of living in many respects reinforces it. 
But first things first, a very brief introduction to our organisation and project. So within the Women Support Project, we have a project called CSC Aware, which focuses on the needs of women who sell exchange sex. CSC Aware also provides a platform for frontline staff from substance use and housing to healthcare and money advice to increase and share their knowledge around the issue of commercial sexual exploitation. Now, as for my input today, I will initially describe what commercial sexual exploitation is. I appreciate that some of you might be less familiar with this issue. And so I decided to take a step back and initially outline what we mean by that. Secondly, I will describe key characteristics of women involved in the sex industry. Afterwards, I will shift my focus to the cost of living and introduce it as a factor that has led many women to either start selling sex or go back to the sex industry. As part of this discussion, I will share a couple of specific examples related to universal credit and loan sharks to really illustrate how the cost of living contributed to an environment where vulnerable women can be exploited. And finally, I will share some information about the resources that are available to you if you would like to learn more about this issue. So as Katie has very helpfully outlined at the start, in Scotland, commercial sexual exploitation is recognised as a form of violence against women and girls. To recap, it includes different activities such as prostitution, both on street and indoors, as well as trafficking, lap dancing, wet coming, and pornography. And so this multiplicity is important because oftentimes women transition in and out of these different activities. They may also be involved in different activities simultaneously. So for instance, a woman might be involved in lap dancing as well as escorting. And as we will see later on, this multiplicity of CSC activities has become even more significant in the context of the cost of living. So what are the key reasons for women's involvement in the sex industry? Again, it's something that Katie alluded to at the start, and really at the heart of it lies inequality. It's impossible to separate this issue from gender inequality. We know that up to 90% of individuals in the UK involved in the sex trade are female, and many are single mothers. Uh, this issue is also quite uh, closely tied to economic inequality. Many women enter the sex industry due to poverty and lack of opportunities. This inequality can also be expressed in women's relationships. For instance, they might be manipulated or coerced into selling sex. And additionally, as I will illustrate later on, the cost of living has made it more difficult to assert the boundaries with sex buyers. And finally, there is a great deal of stigma attached to this issue, which can make it difficult for women to disclose the services they involvement and which can keep them trapped in the sex industry if they are not able to access support that they need. What do we know about women involved in the sex industry in Scotland? The encompass network of seven specialist services that support women who sell exchange sex in Scotland developed a snapshot of women's key issues and needs. The snapshot published last year it revealed that the majority of supported women were between the ages of 31 and 40. I will add that this figure is rather consistent across the UK. Additionally, the snapshot showed that over 60% of women experienced domestic abuse, which really speaks to the need of seeing commercial sexual exploitation in relation to other forms of gender-based violence, domestic abuse, sexual violence, and childhood sexual abuse. Also, nearly 70% of supported women experienced homelessness at some stage in their life. 83% of women were using substances, and a stark figure, 93%, 
experience violence, which was directly linked to the involvement in selling or exchanging sex. This included physical and sexual violence. The snapshot highlighted that women have multiple and intertwined support needs. And so all services, both mainstream and specialist, have a role to play in providing a comprehensive support response. Based on the Scottish Government Commission research, which was published a couple of years ago, we know that on average, women who sell exchange sex engage with seven different services. This includes um, money and employment advice, food banks, social works, and criminal justice. Now, as promised, I will shift my focus to the cost of living and the impact it had on women involved in the sex industry. And as a starting point, what's interesting is that the cost of living really increased awareness of this issue. The sex industry has always existed, but media reports in the past three years or so really drew attention to women's constrained choice and risks associated with selling sex. Media also reported an increased number of women advertised um, online. As this graph shows, in the past few years, there has been a very significant increase of advertised profiles on the leading adult website. And this includes women who started selling sex for the first time, as well as women who went back to the sex industry, having left years ago. Commercial sexual exploitation can affect anybody, regardless of the age, education, or current occupation. For example, it was reported that 3% of students in the UK were already involved in the sex industry to raise money. And 6% would consider the involvement in the case of an emergency. Mothers and single mothers in particular started selling sex to be able to support their families. Let's listen to this woman's Janelle story. In fact, before I start the video, I'm mindful that this may not work for some of you, but the slides in, and including this video will be shared with you afterwards. However, even though it's important to consider individual motivations that lead women to start selling sex, it's the actions of those who take advantage of women's vulnerabilities that create an exploitative dynamics. Let's consider this case. A woman called Jay faces long waits for the universal credit and doesn't have enough money to cover the basics. She resorts to shoplifting, but is caught by the shop manager. The manager presents her with an ultimatum. She is either reported to the police or agrees to a sexual activity. The woman agrees to the latter. Afterwards, the shop manager promises Jay a 40 quid worth of stock if she does that again. As Jay shared, this seemed like a fortune. And so for the last few months, she has been leaving her baby next door and going back to the shop. And what is clear from this real case study is that the woman faced negative consequences if she hadn't agreed to the manager's conditions. Those consequences included being reported to the police, 
uh, not being able to provide for her baby and not being able to acquire resources by other means. In contrast, the shop manager was able to exert his domination and achieve sexual gratification by taking advantage of women's unmet needs. Loan sharks, another example, and as John made it already clear, it has links with commercial sexual exploitation. But to add to John's input, um, as an example, it was reported in England and Wales that 10% of loan sharks demanded payment in the form of sexual favours uh, or asked women to agree to sexual favours if they defaulted on repayments. One affected woman shared this. I'm scared of what he can do. I had to sleep with him because I could not afford the payments. I feel unclean. I knew it was wrong, but he took a photo of my daughter coming out of school and sent it to me saying, we know what she looks like. Again, it's clear from this case that the woman's compliance was underpinned by deep fear that if she had said no, she would have faced negative consequences for her and her daughter. And once again, these and this and other women's voices shared, they show how important it's to consider a wide range of factors that lead to women's involvement in the sex industry. These include systemic inequalities, women's individual financial circumstances, vague reasons, as well as actions of others, including actions of sex buyers. Now, if we were to summarize the key impacts of the cost of living on CUC, one of the changes in some instances is different motivations. Again, the reasons that women may start selling sex are very diverse, but some services reported that while in the past women sold sex in order to fund substance use, for example, now we are very clear that we are doing this to pay the bills. The higher number of women in the sex industry, something that I described earlier, resulted into a highly competitive market. As a result, women need to tap into different markets and settings in order to expand the client base. For example, one woman, Audrey, was selling sex independently at home, but recently joined a brothel. She sees eight to 10 clients in the brothel to get the same amount of money as seeing three clients at home. The Encompass snapshot, which I introduced earlier, showed that women in the sex industry experience different forms of violence. In addition to physical and sexual violence, they also experience harassment, robbery, and threats to reveal the identity. And these risks and threats have become more pronounced in the context of the cost of living. living. Sex buyers know that women are vulnerable and it's more difficult for women to say no to acts that we do not feel comfortable with. As one woman also said, I wanted to take time off after being assaulted, but I don't feel financially able to. My rising bills are constantly in the back of my mind. The cost of living has also contributed to the increased intensity of women's involvement. To put it simply, women do more for less. Spend more hours creating images on subscription-based platforms such as OnlyFans or see more clients in a day or a week. And finally, and problematically, it is difficult for women to make an informed decision when they are faced with crisis. Many women enter the sex industry based on media reports, which portray involvement in the sex industry as empowering and granting financial freedom. But this narrative is often silent on risks that women face, including physical and sexual violence, which we talked about, as well as constrained future opportunities should we decide to leave the sex industry. As one woman shared, she went for a job interview and the interviewers told her that they had done a background check on her and they printed screenshots of pornography that she was in. 
The woman concluded that the sex industry might be her only option, and she doubted if it was a way back. So to finish off my presentation, some information about the resources that are available to you if you would like to learn more about commercial sexual exploitation and the issue of selling or exchanging sex. Our CSC Work Project offers a number of opportunities, including training, events, and written resources. In relation to training, we offer a number of different online training opportunities. For example, our introductory training session on commercial sexual exploitation provides a more in-depth overview of activities associated with CSC, something that I outlined at the beginning. It also discusses the law surrounding prostitution-related offences and indicators of women's involvement in selling sex. Another training opportunity is facilitating disclosures of selling sex. We heard from services that many workers do not feel confident in asking women about the involvement, yet we know that this is a key factor that enables women to open up and seek support. And so to address common concerns that women and workers have, we have developed this session, which also includes our most recent animation, Building Bridges, facilitating disclosures of selling sex. Now, as for the events, we deliver three webinars for frontline staff every three months or so. Over the past two years or so, we have delivered a number of webinars on different themes, such as housing, and women selling or exchanging sex, as well as the subjects of um, substance use, mental health, motherhood, and trauma-informed support. These events are very much practitioner-focused. We invite frontline staff to discuss key issues that women face and invite them to share case studies and practice points for other services. And lastly, on our website, CSC Aware, you can find a number of different resources, uh, including interviews with frontline staff, uh, research, as well as reports from our focus group with frontline staff. The links to these resources are available in the chat, and uh, they will also be shared with you as part of a follow-up email. But if you would like to find out more, or if you have any questions that we don't manage to get to, please feel free to drop us an email. So thank you so much, and I'm handing it over to John. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for, for that really great presentation here to, to kind of wrap us up and on our, our session of presenters. Uh, I hope everyone found um, all of what we've been saying today uh, as something really interesting and hope you can take away some stuff. We will have a QA and a session, so could I invite Laura, Katie and Robin to put their cameras back on and unmute themselves because we've all got questions here for each of us. So I'm really glad to see everyone's been um, involving themselves and, and, and adding stuff to the Q&A. So thank you very, very much for, for doing that. So I'll start off with the first question and it's for yourself, Katie. Um, and it's from uh, one of our, um, our, our attendees. And it's just asking, you mentioned that, that profit is made out of the abuse and exploitation of women's poverty. Could you say something more about how the Scottish Government or COSLA uh, and COSLA are planning to tackle the sex industry that's, which sees profits? Sorry, Katie, you're on mute. I think I would have learned to yeah. take that off by now, wouldn't you? Um, so the Scottish Government has a framework, um, has been developing a framework with um, stakeholders and partners, and that includes COSLA, uh, in that um, a, a framework to tackle men's demand for prostitution. Um, and within that framework, uh, the development of key principles has also been developed and has um, been supported by both spheres of government in terms of those principles being the principles of working together uh, upon which this work uh, is going to be embedded as it moves forward, which is fantastic. Um, the Scottish Government are at the moment in process of uh, developing um, um, proposals in relation to piloting approaches at a local level to support women 
and to look at tackling um, men's demand from both a preventative perspective and uh, across the kind of sphere, those areas that I had discussed earlier, the, the, the gamut of equally safe covers. So this is part of uh, the justice work. It sits very firmly um, and linked to uh, the vision for justice, but also um, the equally safe strategy and uh, will be part of the ongoing work as the um, delivery plan um, moves forward after it's published hopefully this month. So on so in relation to that area of work within the context of how we're moving forward to prevent and tackle violence against women and girls there's a very clear focus on that um, and of course COSLA um, are very supportive of, of um, the principles in relation to how uh, this work's going to unfold. So we're at that stage at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if we've actually got any Scottish government uh, colleagues actually here today, um, but if not, um, uh, I can certainly put some contact details in the chat and if people are more interested, they can follow that up with their Scottish government colleagues who are leading on this work. That would be helpful. Thank you, Katie. Does anybody get anything else, Robin or, or Laura, if you want to add anything to that? No? Excellent. Next question is, does the panel think that a form of universal income for all would alleviate the pressures on women and reduce vulnerability? Would anybody like to take that question? It wasn't for it, it was for the whole panel. Um, I, I'm happy to, to take a wee bit into it. Um, I think there's been some good research into universal income and about what, what it would need to be. Um, I think that there probably is a bit more work that needs to be done in terms of finding out what actually the set of levels would be. I was at an event down in Inverclyde um, at the tail end of last year, uh, tail end of last year, no, earlier this year, sorry, losing track of time. Um, and we were discussing that that very subject. And I think the fact is it's about, there still needs to be a kind of view on what kind of, what, what the level needs to be set at before it, it reduces vulnerability. But ultimately, we need to do as much as we possibly can to reduce vulnerability right across the country um, because vulnerability in rural areas is just as prevalent as vulnerability in urban areas. But some of the drivers could be different. So we need to look at what those drivers are. So I think we are, we're, it's something that is worth more consideration, is, is my opinion. Would anybody like to add anything to that? Yeah, I suppose... Um... There's a lot of work being done with our colleagues at the Poverty Alliance on a minimum income guarantee. Um, and I think it's a really good idea personally. Um, but like John says, there needs to be some serious consideration about like levels and, and how this would be rolled out. Um, and a consideration from our team in terms of if something's easy to use, it's easy to abuse. Um, thinking about something like universal credit, what we often see is couples claiming as a couple, um, because you have to claim as a household with universal credit, um, and it's the, the benefit is paid to one bank account. And then it's assumed that those partners would share that money. In our experience, that is not how it works. Um, most people here will be uh, aware of the uh, option to split payments, but you need to ask for that. Um, and what we see in our experience is by the point where you need to ask for a split payment, you're too far gone. Um, we are actually advocating for universal credit to be paid directly to each party as adults separately um, to avoid this issue of, of partners um, exploiting each other's finances. Um, and when we're speaking to the, the Poverty Alliance about the minimum income guarantee, we're also recommending that it be paid on an individual level rather than households because if you have to ask for a split payment, cat's already out of the bag that your abuser knows that you've cottoned on to what they're doing and you're trying to find money for yourselves and they're going to continue to exploit you because of that and perhaps violence might escalate. So just a lot of considerations about how that would be implemented. Um, I wrote a blog post about that, I think, during 16 days. I'll see if I can find it and pop it in the chat. If you wouldn't mind, that'd be absolutely perfect. Um, thank you, Robin. And the next question is for you, Robin, in any case. Uh, so Laura, do you want to come in? Sorry. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, I very much agree, John, with what you have said. I do think that it's a positive step, but given that we have so many ongoing conversations, we do need to see whether it offers 
a fundamental opportunity and an opportunity to make a fundamental change. And I think that vulnerability, the span of it, it it's so broad and it's also about policies in other areas, not related just to economics. Um, it's also about immigration policies. We know that um, a large proportion of women involved in the sex industry are migrant women, for example, and are asylum seekers. Um, it's also about education, access to employment and wider uh, welfare strategies. Katie, do you want to add anything? I will just really quickly, <clears throat> not specifically on that, but generally about that focus in relation to um, <clears throat> women's equality and economic equality sits at the heart of that and it sits at the heart of vulnerabilities within the context of um, the, the, the issues um, that we're talking about here. And I just <clears throat> so I just want to highlight that there's a lot of work going on in Scotland at the moment that's highlighting the importance of policy coherence. And by that, I mean <clears throat> how different parts of policy are talking to each other. And if we're actually all looking at the lens of women, uh, poverty and empowerment or women, economic empowerment, every time that there are kind of key decisions made. And I'm not talking just about the politicians here because there are lots of, there's a huge number of people in this call who within the context of their own um, professional environments will have the opportunity to inform and shape policy, will have the opportunity to um, in, inform the design of how uh, policy is operationalized uh, within the context of your own work at a local level as individuals have the power to reply to consultations or, or get involved in um, community um, discussions uh, and engagements, which can help inform your local area's decision making. Um, you know, everybody has the power to take that lens and, um, and just apply it. Even if you just do it for a week, think about women and um, access to equitable economic power and, and and lay that over you know the decisions that are being made the way that we are doing things and if we do that then we will begin to see a real hopefully we would begin to see that real shift you know what we're talking about this is such a fundamental route in terms of this continuing inequality that 51 percent actually slightly over 51 percent of our population face on a day-to-day -day basis it's faced so daily it's almost invisible and it can't continue to be invisible because that this is these vulnerabilities are what that leads to. So I'll shut up. That's my soapbox. But, you know, at every level, if we work together on this, then, you know, we can affect real change. Thanks, Katie. And I think that's a really good point about working together. I think that's been the one thing we've tried to tie together throughout the, the, the four speakers you've heard today is about how we all have to work together. It is about partnerships. It is about all of us. And that goes for everyone here. You have the opportunity to, to have met all of us today and work in partnership with us to try and deal with the issues that we've been raised today. And just coming to a point that Laura raised there, and it's a question for Robin, and it was about um, if you have any examples of supporting asylum-seeking women who have turned to money lenders or have been exploited to get money to pay for home office visa fees. Uh, uh, throw my laptop out the window is my answer to that. Um, we have had a few cases like this in our um, in our experience. Um, we are open to like giving guidance. So if this is something that you want to have a chat with us on a case by case basis, you've got our email address in there. Um, so maybe you could speak to one of our case workers to kind of chat this case through. Because um, I imagine you're asking because it's a live case. But in general, for people that have no recourse to public funds, it's very difficult to access funds to pay off debts and things like that, especially if it's to do with illegal money lending. So there's no negotiating with those lenders. Um, in terms of other forms of debt, more legitimate forms of debt, we have quite a lot of experience with negotiating directly with creditors on behalf of our clients, explaining what's happened, explaining what economic abuse is, that it's actually a crime um, and it's a form of domestic abuse. So I can't off the top of my head think of it, an exact example of when we've done this for an asylum seeker, but that is the first point of call is asking the creditor, listen, this was done as part of an abusive tactic. Um, we would like you to write it off. Oh, hi, Mouse. Um, we would like you to write it off um, as a gesture of goodwill because most creditors have write-offs at their discretion. They are 
um, most of them, especially larger banks and things like that, they are um, insured to do that. And what you can do is you can speak to their responsible business team if they have one or vulnerable customers team and ask for that discretion to be implemented. Um, and that's kind of what our training all goes into. So do give us a wee email if you want to have a chat through a specific case um, to do with vulnerabilities like um, recourse to public funds and limited access to, to resources. Um, tricky one. Thanks, Robin. I, I, I can I just add a wee bit there. We have seen people, um, and they have mainly been females, who have been using illegal money lenders to, um, pay for their home office visa. It is something that has anecdotally been coming across our, our table. It's come from partner organisations who have reported them without being able to give us real specifics. So it is something we are seeing. Um, it's a worrying trend. Again, we're lucky, uh, Katie and I are a bit lucky at COSLA that we have a migration team, um, our migration and pop population team um, who are phenomenal and have really great links in. We have flagged this with them so that they're aware of this as being an emerging issue because this is something that we are concerning ourselves about. We haven't had anything that's been directly linked yet, but like I say, anecdotally, we are we have got stuff there. Um, Laura, Katie, is there anything you want to add to that question at all? Is there anything you want to add? No. Next question is from Laura on behalf of someone. So thank you, Laura, for posting it in the, the Q&A. Um, and just saying, it's a question to me, and it's about um, online illegal money lending. It's now both um, illegal money lending probably saw a bit of a sea change um, during the COVID pandemic, where it went from probably about 75% um, or 80% on community based to uh, now almost probably not 50 50, but certainly a lot more people now using online. Facebook is, is the most. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's probably the most seen um, use of online illegal money lending. We've got a couple of cases just now where the lending is taking place. They're very difficult to break down. It's very difficult to get to the bottom of, and we need to try and do as much as we can. I know certainly our counterparts in England have been looking on a pilot project to look at online illegal lending to see how we can move to prosecute them um, easier, easier than what we can just now. But at the moment, we're still really at the beginning of this. It's almost like a completely different type of lending. So we're almost having to um, teach old dogs new tricks, having been here for 16 years. And it's a bit of a sea change for me in terms of looking at how we do that. Another question about illegal money lenders, just saying how do we see many female loan sharks? Um, again, when I first started with the team, I would have said it was only about 10% of the of the loan sharks we were seeing were females. It's almost 50-50 now. Um, we have uh, ongoing at the moment three investigations. Um, two of them are female loan sharks we're investigating and one male. So that's where we are just now in terms of that. There has been a quite significant change uh, in that kind of demographic as well. So that's always interesting to see. Um, are there any ramifications for a person who's using an illegal money lender as lending as lending the money is illegal? Does taking the money make you an accessory or anything? Absolutely not. Uh, and I cannot stress that highly enough. Um, by borrowing from a... Um, a loan shark, you have done nothing wrong. Even if you know the person's a loan shark and you know they're an illegal money lender, it doesn't matter. You have done nothing wrong. You're the victim of a crime. And that's ultimately the way we look at it. You're the victim of a crime. Um, is my service available throughout Scotland? Yes, I cover all 32 local authority areas of Scotland. And as uh, Robin, Katie and Laura know, I like to rant about it a lot because I get out in my travels a lot and use public transport <laughs> it doesn't always work um so yeah i cover all 30 we, my team cover 32 local authority areas um we are out and about at the moment our investigations are um right across the country i think we've got from um yeah we're right across the country just now in terms of investigations and you'll see from the map yes there is a central belt kind of focus from illegal money lenders but I think that's because obviously the population density of Scotland is in, in the central belt. But absolutely. Um, and are illegal money lenders linked to organised crime? Yeah, they are linked, but they're not heavily linked. It's it's probably not high up their their um their details as well. It's not high up within organised criminal gangs, but they are aware of it and they probably allow it to happen on their patch. And how do they get the, get money to loan? 
normally it just starts out with somebody who's got a bit of disposable cash and they decide that I want to make some profit from it and they can lend out at maybe a couple of hundred pounds and get back 40, 50 pounds a week for whoever want, they want it. So, yeah, absolutely. We can, we, it's, it really can start as slow as that as well. And I'm more than happy to, to share my, my address as well. Um, this is a question for you, Laura. Um, you gave two examples that involve institutions who are either disinterested in our communities, um, communities' experience of adversity and poverty, energy providers, or colluding coercive control legal aid. Surely a more effective approach is to bring these two institutions to the table and have conversations. Yeah, I suppose, John, that it's more of a comment um, than a question, um, mm -hmm. unless I'm misunderstanding it. Yes, but, maybe I, sorry. Um, but yes, uh, just to reiterate again, um, and something that I touched upon in the presentation is that women who still exchange sex that on average, they engage with seven different services. We know that disclosures are an issue. But that's not to say that women are not part of the service provision landscape, they very much are. And in, in terms of being able to, to support these women, we need a comprehensive and very much multi-agency support response. Perfect, thank you. Um, just a question there about, does it, do we know the percentage of people experience financial abuse that have a learning disability or a physical disability with additional health conditions? Um, has anybody got an answer for that question or is that something? So in terms of financial abuse, um, we can only speak to our client group. Um, as of last month, we supported 359 women. 61% of those report a health condition or a disability. We don't disaggregate between that data as to whether it's a learning disability or a physical impairment or whatever it may be. Um, that can also include mental, sorry, it can also include mental health um, conditions. So 61% of those 359 women, and that's just in Glasgow. Um, but we do know that um, people with learning difficulties, um, they are much more likely to be experiencing gender-based violence across the board. Um, and people with disabilities in general are much more vulnerable. So it's hard to say um, statistically. Um, and I do think it's something we could do to disaggregate that data a little bit further. Um, but any frontline workers here know there's a, a limit to the amount of questions you're, you're wanting to ask your clients. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the general picture, 61%. But I would guess that that number is likely higher um, and people are just not disclosing for whatever reason. Again, thinking about those layers of shame and taboo and stigma um, that maybe keep people from sharing um, their experiences. If... I could add to that as well, mm -hmm. even though I appreciated that the question was, was aimed at Robin. Um, but based on our 22 Encompass snapshot, which um, again is developed by seven specialist services that support women involved in the sex industry, um, we know from the snapshot was done a couple of years ago, uh, but out of 100 supported women during one week, so that figure is just for one week, uh, four uh, women uh, disclosed that they were assessed for a learning disability and 19 uh, women had a physical disability. So the numbers overall, they were significant. And also, if very cheekily, um, I could add as well that uh, for the rest of the year, we will be doing a lot of work um, around women with disabilities. So that will also include women with learning disabilities and women's involvement in selling or exchanging sex. So if any organisations would like to contribute or if you would like to explore this more, please do get in touch. Thank you both for, for those questions, Katie. Yeah, can I just add that? that was a that was a, a a brilliant um point raised um and just to let people know that um within the context of the delivery plan that will be forthcoming hopefully um next month this is an area that's been uh, recognized nationally and uh, nationally by local government that we are committed in relation to this to really looking at um the additional risks that are faced um by people who have learning disabilities, disabilities, um, and um, there hopefully will be a really strong programme of work that sits underneath that commitment. So watch this space. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And I think that's a very positive note to kind of finish up on there. And, and thank you for that. And thank you for everyone that sent in questions um, and, and there. So we're really at the final stages of where we have been today. Um, and, and we'll just kind of wrap it up. So really thankful for, for what we've done there. I know there was a question uh, about um, on the chat there I just saw about um, accessing support. Absolutely, we that can be done. Um, so please get in touch with us. I'll make sure our email address is put up here at the end, so we can certainly uh, work the support. And I see somebody's come back as well, um, as well to answer that. So I really appreciate it. So we well, just one last ask of everyone here today, and that is just to please fill out this evaluation that we've got. Um, I will slip to the next slide so that you can do it. It's done through Menti. You can do it at your leisure. It doesn't need to be done right now. It's not. I've set it up so that it doesn't have to be that. We do it right here and now, and I've also put the link in there directly to it. There are just five or six questions there that just ask you what you thought of the day and hopefully get there. And this is a wee second slide there to ask what your thought, to give any other thoughts to what we've done today. But I'd just like to finish off by thanking everyone here today. I'd like to thank Katie Brown for coming along and giving us a real great insight into what is certainly um, an exciting time for the development of Equally Safe and, and continue all that good work. I'd like to thank Robert Moffat Wall. Robin, um, do you want to say just a few words? Because I know that this is kind of one of your last things that you're doing. Yeah, um, news to everybody. I am leaving the financially included team, <laughs> unfortunately. It, uh, today is my second last day. Tomorrow I'm going to go and hand it all my kit and cry and hug my team. Um, but I'm, I'm moving on to work um, on public debt. So I'm still in the money sector. I'm going to be trying to reform the way that local authorities uh, reclaim public debt and get those families out of the poverty cycle. But um, I love this work. Um, it's no secret. And I, I want to thank you all for coming today and listening to us all and engaging. So I really appreciate that. But I've given the um, generic financially included email that the whole team monitor so if you have any questions or you want to consult about cases please do get in touch with the team there that you'll be in great hands with them thank you robin and laura i'll leave the final word to you because you put all so much effort into this event you were the the key driver behind it so i just want to a personal vote of thanks to you from myself for pulling all this together and putting all the hard work in so i'll leave the last words to you today Ah, no, <laughs> no, I just want to say thanks very much to John, Robin and Katie for the inputs. Uh, it's been really great to learn from yourselves and equally thank you so much to all of you who attended the event. You know, as I was listening, I appreciated that at times it can be hard to, to hear what, what we were covering. And so thank you so much for being open and brave. And while I was reading the comments in the chat and I appreciate that I wasn't able to respond to all of them, uh, I recognise some familiar faces, but equally it was so lovely to virtually uh, meet some new people. So I hope we can connect. And as all the speakers said, if you have any questions, our mailbox is open. Thank you, Laura, and thank you everyone for coming along today. There were so many people here today. It was great um, to have so many people along, and as Laura rightly said, it was good to see some new faces as well that are hopefully got some great learning points along here today. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you now. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.